if you can't tell that I love the music in the way that I played, then I failed you. Mm. The music saved me. Not yeah. The craft, the music. That's what saved me. That's what saved me. What's up, everybody? My name is Matt, aka Cut Corners. I'm the host of the show, Serato Unscripted. This year, it's the 50th anniversary of hip hop, and for the occasion, we've got God's favorite DJ, Clark Kent, as our special guest. Thank you, thank you. It's an honor to be here. And that was very nice. Hey, you. man. And because you know, when we when we're talking about hip hop, without the DJ, would there even be hip hop? Absolutely not. Right? Nope. It's the beginning of the culture. Absolutely. So, thank you very much, Clark. Thank you for being our guest today. Thank you for asking me. I, 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 I always will say that I find it an honor that someone wants to even ask me questions. So I'm, I'm glad to be here, especially with a room full of people that I actually really like. Well, man, thank you for your contributions to the culture, hip hop, DJing. Um, you know, you've been a huge inspiration and influence on myself and pretty much everyone in this room, I can guarantee. Well, thank you. Um, the first question I really wanted to ask you specifically, uh, who, who's the most influential DJs for you personally? Um, the most influential to me is Larry Levin. Um, I had a notion in my head when I had started DJing because I loved music. I didn't, I don't, I don't love DJing. I love music. And because I love music is why I DJ. And I love so much music that I tried to figure out how to be able to play everything. And then you would go places and you would hear somebody only play club music, only play, um, disco or only play uh, funk or only play breaks and you go everywhere. I would go everywhere very, very young and hear just sections of music. And I, I kept thinking to myself, well, why can't I play this rock and roll record? Or why can't I play this dance record when I'm over here? So when I was trying to be creative musically, when I was young, I played everything. And it wasn't until I met Larry LeVan that I realized I'm not bugging. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. you would go in a club and he's known for being one of the leaders of disco and house music. But then you'd hear Wild Cherry. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yes, I'm not bugging. You know what I mean? So it and, and then I would hear Frankie Crocker on the radio and he's pulling records that Larry played in the club. And I'm just like, oh, see, I'm really not crazy. It, it's about the music. It's not about a section of music. And so for that. You know, I silently learned that I wasn't going crazy and it made me understand that he's the most important. He's like the most important DJ that I've ever met. Now, the other influential DJ to me is Grandmaster Flowers. He's literally the best mixing DJ I've ever heard. Like still, like I never heard two a person put two records together for the length of time that he would do it, hold the mix on records that had live drummers and live um, instrumentation on better than Grandmaster Flowers. So those two guys are the, the most influential and most important to me. Can you talk a little bit more about your relationship with, specifically with Larry LeVan? You, you work pretty closely with him from what I understand. I, 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 when I say closely, I would say I would be wherever he was trying to pick up the game because once i figured that part out like you can do it i i was like i want to hear everything he's playing because i want to know am i on top of my music as much as i thought i was you know what i mean so when you go and hear larry levin let's say you go to the garage you know if you go to the garage you already know you're going to hear a lot of club music you're going to you, you're going to hear some house music and the club is going to be boom 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 but there's going to be a moment where it becomes boom boom Boom. And it'll be sleazy in the middle of the moment, in the middle of the night. And you're just like, how did he fuck did he get there? You know what I'm saying? Like Larry LeVan literally had the ability to turn the music off and make the crowd appreciate the silence. And I'd be like, yes, yes, you you got to give him a second to catch up. You know what I'm saying? Because he would be so far ahead of everybody musically. And I'm just like, if you give him a break, they're going to catch up. And then you could hit them with a record that's 90 beats per minute and they'll lose their shit. And so I was around and yes, I know everybody else who was around. I know Junior. I know everybody else. I knew Tony. I knew everybody else who was there, but I was like, the game is coming from him. I knew Frankie. 
in the young Frankie days, I, I was like, the game's coming from him. All of y'all are taking the game from him. I'm taking the game from him. Musically, on the fact that you should be able to play anything. Like, if I didn't spend time with him, I never would have tried Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in a club. Wow. But I did it. And it made the crowd go, what the fuck? And then I hit him with a record and they were like, that was crazy. You know what I mean? But I wouldn't have thought, because I love Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, that I could play it in a club until you, you, you experience um, someone who truly is like, I'm going to take you on a goddamn trip. And so being around him like that, like I have like his his reels in my house. Wow. Like I have some of his reels in my wow. house. Like I have records that say Levan on them in my house. But when you're with, when you're around and those things are happening, you're getting these records and you're playing the same club as him or whatever, you're not thinking until later and you're just like, fuck, you was right next to a genius for all of this time. Yo, you have a genius's records in your house. You have a genius's, you know, masters in, or, 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 or um, quarter inch reels are in your house. Like, you're not thinking that then you're thinking, oh, that's big Larry. You know what I mean? Oh, that's, that's Larry's joint. Oh, you, so, you know, later on is when you get to realize that uh, you were in the presence of pure genius. Like he's DJ genius. Mm -hmm. Like if there's a Mount Rushmore, like he should be on Mount Rushmore three times and then someone else can be on it with him. You know, like yeah. that's what I think when I think Larry Levin. And then, you know, the conversations would be short. The conversations wouldn't be as extensive as somebody else because one, I wasn't, I wasn't gay. You know what I'm saying? And I wasn't playing in his spaces as much as maybe a junior or somebody else, but I was there. You know what I'm saying? And he would let me play. I played the Thorns before. You wow. know what I'm saying? Because he trusted me musically, but it wasn't about that. It was more about the conversations we would have about music that led me to know, um, you, this is what makes you a great DJ. It's not, it's not reading a crowd because it, I, I always ask DJs, like, what's the most important part of DJing? A lot of them say moving, the, I mean, reading the crowd or mixing and, and all kinds of other things. I, the answer is always going to be wrong if your answer isn't music first. Mm. Because how do you DJ without music? So it's always the music. But that's, that's what I got from um, the time hang around Larry LeVan. Pete DJ Jones introduced me to Larry LeVan when I was like 14. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. PDJ Jones, who I met through Grandmaster Flowers, <laughs> introduces me to Larry LeVan when I'm like 14, 15. So like the the experience that I'm get playing around him, because we used to play um what was the joint on, on House thing that they made that they made the movie um oh, I can't remember the name of the joint. I, I can't remember the name of the club, but we played the same club together. The, it was in the movie that had Lawrence Fish with King of New York. Oh yeah. The world. Okay. The world. We played at that club together. We played at that club on the same night. Wow. And imagine playing just to play with someone. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I would be playing just to play records with him and see what he thought. You know what I'm saying? Like he was always the one that I would be like, I wonder what he thinks. Yeah. I think that's what's so remarkable about your career too, is you've had this perspective from before hip hop, yeah, through hip hop, mm -hmm. and now where we're at right now, yeah. And one of the cool things I just want to touch on that you talked about with Larry Levan was like the dynamics of his DJ of his DJ sets, and you talk about how he created space mm -hmm. to create more impact when he dropped the next track, yeah, like the silence or, or or whatever. He he, it's almost like he gave the crowd enough time to be like, "We fucking love you," <laughs> because he would stop. Music would be off on one of the best sound systems in the world. And they would just be like, you know what? Fuck it. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> and I'll be like, I need that. I need that. So, you know, yeah, he, he, he's a special breed. Yeah. Another thing you talk about is, is, is the variety of genres and music that yeah. he plays and how that f inspired you. The thing is, it, is that it didn't inspire me. It just let me know that I wasn't crazy because I played that way. You know what I'm saying? I play. Imagine this. You go into a club and this guy's playing all kinds of music 
that I'm already doing, but I'm cutting records out in the midst of all of that. But then you go into this club and you, but, but you're cutting them up. You're in your house and you think I, I can't really play this outside. <laughs> and then you get to a club and somebody's playing it outside and you're like, Oh shit, it's on. So from that point, now I'm at Union Square and I'm playing a rock record and I'm at Latin quarters and I'm, I'm hitting you with some disco. I'm wherever I go. Like I've never been a this kind of DJ or that kind of DJ. I'm just a DJ, mm. you know? Now let's talk about that in the context of hip hop music, because mm-hmm. like I said, we we're talking about your, your career, your legacy and, and hip hop as a DJ. Right. And before hip hop, I had a, I had a conversation with Jazzy Jeff and Kenny Dope about this and they spoke about it, um, you know, before hip hop, mm-hmm. the time before hip hop what DJs were playing and, you know, with the DJ playing such an important role in the, in the development of hip hop culture, can you talk about your experience with how those records and what records specifically maybe that you latched onto that you brought into the, into the world of hip hop or how that affected your style of DJing? I didn't have to bring a record into the world of hip hop because we were using all kinds of records to create the bed of what would become hip hop mm. music or the music that lived within hip hop. Um, you know, like we cut up breaks, but those records were records first. Mm. You know what I mean? Like Apache was just a good record before mm. it became one of our favorite breaks. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, we played disco. Mm. We played R and B. We played funk and soul. And then we figured out sections of these records to extend that made them the feeling of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? They weren't records that were supposed to live there. What we did to them made them live Mm -hmm. there. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like, yo, let's let this record play all the way through. No, it's like, no, let's take the good section of that record, cut it up for three minutes, and then it lives there. That way. It doesn't live there just playing because you're going like, wait a minute, do I actually love this record? You know what I mean? Like we cut up Frisco Disco, but if you would go to a club, you would hear Frisco Disco play all the way through. We would cut up Sing Sing, but I could go to hear Tom, Tony Humphreys play and Sing Sing would play all the way through. And I would go like, yo, there's a break there. Like, <laughs> but I understood these records come from a different genre and we used them and manipulated them to make them part of our genre. But we didn't have rap records and we didn't like when James Brown was making records. He didn't know he was making breaks. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He just know that there was a section where he gave the drummer some. Now you gave the drummer some. Now we're going, oh man, that, oh wait. Like if we keep giving the drummer some, then we got this. You know what I'm saying? Funky drummer isn't a break until we make it a break. You know? I've- Soul power isn't a break until we make it a break, especially because it's so short. We're just like, we're going to keep manipulating the beginning until it becomes something that's super funky. But even if you let Soul Power play all the way through, the shit is fucking amazing. Yeah. You know? Now, I know we weren't going to do top fives or nothing, but mm-hmm. I do want to ask, is there any, like, memorable, what's what's the most memorable breakbeat, in your opinion, for you personally? Most memorable breakbeat? I mean, it might be regular to everybody, but Mardi Gras is fucking crazy. Yep. Mardi Gras is crazy. And so is Apache. And the reason why is because there's so many parts that you can manipulate in, in, in Apache that are just beautiful sounding. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, phenomenon theme. Mm. Uh, Shangri-La, uh, Paradise. Um, Frisco Disco. Yeah. You know, it, it was a disco record called Every Man. There's a section of the record that I used to bring back and bring back, bring back just for the groove. It wasn't considered a break, but I would bring it back for the groove. And, you know, it would it would affect people a certain way, but it wasn't like a break. It was like the groove just felt crazy. Like Take a Chance by Pleasure. Mm. The groove in the section where they play the, f- the, 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 f- the, um, the muted horn is amazing. Come down to earth is <laughs> like, 
I, I I think the records that I'm mentioning are the records that effectively blew block parties into the stratosphere. Because when they came on, it was just like, oh my God, listen to that shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When came come down to earth, and a block party, oh my God. It used to be a movie. You know what I mean? So and and we cut them up, but they were disco records. You know what I mean? But they they just they just they just did something else. Cream always rises to the top <laughs> by buying a boogie. That shit at a block party was ignorant. Wow. It's so many like great older disco feeling records that the breaks on them just like felt crazy. And my love of of the break happened at block parties. Yeah, I, honestly, I'm very envious. I wish I could have had that opportunity to experience that firsthand. That must have been such a magical time. No, that to me is is probably some of the the best times that like I've ever um got to experience. Yes, I love playing clubs. But if you give me a a 1978 block party, yeah, I'll trade a club for that <laughs> any day because a club is built for you to play for people, for them to dance. You play a block party and make a block party dance, you're stronger than the guy who plays in the club. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because you've got to make kids, old folks, your age, all ages are at a block party. But if you get that whole block to move, that's 10 times harder than rocking a club. Because they came to the club to dance. It's almost like their prerequisite is to dance. So let's see if you can keep it rocking. You know what I'm saying? They're coming there to be rocking. Yeah. Let's see if you can keep it rocking. But a block party is like, well, what you going to do here? Let's see. Yeah. Because now you got to make my grandmother dance <laughs> as well as my son, as well as my friends, as well as my peoples from across town who don't really know who the fuck you are. Make them all dance. That's a harder task than rocking a club. Block parties, um, park jams. What? Yeah, I, it's funny because like I, when somebody says, oh, there's a block party in my neighborhood, I'm like, who's playing? Who's playing? <laughs> and I'm always like, who's playing? Because maybe if I know him, I'll come and I get on the set. Like for block party purposes, like I, block parties are some other shit. Yeah, that's the Block favorite. parties and park jams, man. Yeah. Well, let's talk about clubs though, because mm -hmm. obviously you're, you're talking about playing in clubs and you've mm -hmm. had some incredible residencies and... Yeah. Can, can you just talk about some of those resonances or any ones that particularly stood out to you as, you know, formative for you? Or I think the, the, the one that really uh, changed everything for me was uh, Union Square. And every time I mention it is one thing I must say. I, I feel like I owe a major part of my career to the selflessness, selflessness of Red Alert. Because it was his club. Mm -hmm. He gave me one o'clock every week. Wow. When it's happening, you think you're not even thinking of it. You know what I'm saying? But like when you look back, you're like, what the talk? Like one o'clock? That that's fucking prime time. Yeah. Like, how did you He just is like, Go ahead. And I would lose my shit like every week at the club. And after doing that, I never opened again. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I opened a lot before then. And then he gave me one o'clock and he would let me go off and I would do what he's not going to do. I would be the cutting and scratching inside of the club. And, and, and I had a crew that danced when I cut and scratch, but I was going crazy. Like I was doing what you would see at a rap battle or at a DJ battle, but I was making it musical mm -hmm. for clubs so that when you heard it, it didn't feel like you couldn't dance to it. So. I did musically what was supposed to be done, but if you were there and you were a DJ, you were going, oh, he's, no one's going to beat him tonight. And because that's the way I, I, I approached that moment. And um, from that point on, though, I, I never was an opener again. And, I, and I, had, I felt like I owed that to him. So that was probably the most important time in my uh, DJ career. And I started really young. And, and yes, I've played practically any club you can name, but I might have played a lot of them in the opening capacity or the capacity right before the guy who was the main guy. So I would make an impact, but the impact is really when you're holding from 12 to four. And that 12 to four came after Red Alert was like, go on at one o'clock. Mm. And 
there it is. Yeah, shout out, red alert. Nah, not shout out. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you. and whatever he needs when it comes to me, I will do it. I mean, I guess that goes back to the first question, you know, what are the most important DJs for you? Yeah. I guess Red Alert. Yeah, he's one of the most important DJs for for sure. Yeah. And I think he's actually one of the best DJs around. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I've, I've admitted this before. I don't have a problem with no DJs. <laughs> like, if, if we're playing together, I don't have a problem with no DJs. Red Alert is the only DJ that I have literally ever had like a problem with in a club. Like, damn, I, cause like, because I know where he's at with it musically, you know, musically music is the difference. It's not about how good you cut and scratch. I don't care about that. Can I cut and scratch? Sure. But we're in a club that cutting and scratching you, this, you, if you, is that what you came to do? You're nowhere close. You're not even going to be in the same stratosphere as where I'm going to be at because it's about the music. Mm. And in a club, it's really about the music. Yeah. Red Alert is a demon in a club. I remember I had to play a club with him one night and I was like, Red, you, you want me to go first? Like, I will treat him like that. Like, you want me to go first? He was like, nah, nah, I'll go. And I was like, nah, nah, please. And he was like, nah, nah, I'll go. And he went on and he put a <laughs> clinic together. And I was just like, what the fuck? Because musically, he's all the way there. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, when someone's so musically there, you might have a problem in the club with him. And I, I swear to God, that night I was like, what the fuck am I going to do with all that Red Alert just did? <laughs> and I don't know where I pulled it from, pause, but I, I, I figured it out. And, um, but it was like literally, one of the most challenging nights in the club. And I just was like, I love him for that. I love him for being like one of literally the only people who can literally challenge me in a club. And I, it's, the only other guy like I, I probably ever felt challenged in a club with is, is, is Lil Louis Vega. Oh yeah. And, but he, he thinks that way musically too. Right. Like he's, da -da! you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like he's, Lil Louis Vega is, is, is literally the house version of me in the club. God damn, he, he, you could tell that he is in love with the music and I'm in love with music, but he's in love with his genre and it, it shows so much. Like if you don't like house music, when you fucking finish with Larry, when you finish with, with Lil Louis Vega, you might be like, I'm about to go every, go buy everything I just <laughs> because he, presents it so perfectly he's yeah it's great to hear you talk about like such in, in such you know high regard people like louis vega and no. larry levan who yeah. are typically not probably known for so much as part of hip-hop but obviously super adjacent to hip-hop music i look at larry levan and i would think he is extremely important because yes. we played the same kind of records you know what i'm saying we played the funks and the souls and the R&Bs and the, and the discos to make what is the bed. But he was playing that. That was his shit. The first time I ever heard my Jamaican guy was in the garage. Wow. So I was, I went back like, oh shit, there's this record coming out. <laughs> Grace Jones got a record and it's this. Yeah. And it came out and every DJ was cutting the record up. But Larry Levan was the guy who I, did you, he played Feel Up in a club by Grace Jones. I was just like, oh my God, yo, wait till you hear this. All right. Yeah. Spinderella. The original Spinderella. Wanda D. Shucks. One of the, the best club DJs back in the days was Lady D. Who used to DJ at the Red Parrot with Reggie Wells, who was one of the leaders in New York clubs. You know, she she was she was a beast. I think it's cool too, especially because like now I'm a little bit older and understanding you know the history. I didn't obviously grow up in New York myself, mm -hmm. but understanding that things like the loft and all these things were happening simultaneously Man, with Cuso's, it. Right. Man, Cuso's house, yeah, dog. Brooklyn had one of the best clubs. They had the zoo, and people used to come from everywhere to go to the zoo. Grandmaster Flowers was the DJ at the zoo. So you got to hear Grandmaster Flowers play. 
there was a, a crew called the Disco Twins out of Queens. We had um, Master D and Von K. Master D later on changed his name to DJ Lance. Like Master D and Von K are from Brooklyn. Like park jams were park jams based off of the DJ. The MC was later. So all of these park jams were by dudes who became pillars in hip hop. You know what I'm saying? So we can't act like there weren't things happening in any, in, in any other uh, boroughs because they just were. Mm. You know what I'm saying? They were. Like, Molly really is from Queensbridge. You're going to act like Molly didn't do park jams? Yes, he did. You know what I'm saying? King Charles, he did park jams. He did block parties. All of these people were doing it all at the same time. So as the way that we played the music changing I would say that started in the Bronx, but there were park jams before. There were parties before the term hip hop happened. The energy of park jams is what was the beginnings of what this thing was gonna be. And we were all playing the same music until we're trying to find these records that do that. So I guess I have a question about that specifically, like how important as a as a DJ is it for you? Do you think for DJs to play music that is new or, you know, upcoming for for an audience? Well, I think um, or discover new music to to show and like expose to an audience. I think it's important if you care about the music. Yeah. There's a bunch of DJs who don't care about the music. There's a bunch of DJs who only care about oh. I can make some money. Oh, I'm an incredible scratcher and cutter and I could beat everybody in a battle. There's DJs who that's, that's their thing. Yeah. You know, so they're not necessarily caring about turning people on to music. They're DJs who never leave their bedroom. They're not going to care about turning somebody on to music. Mm. The guys who are given the, the, um, the ability to answer to a crowd in a, in a, in a club, the guys who are given the ability to answer to the public from a radio perspective, answer to the public from a, I'm making mixes that will be heard um, in, the, in the public. They should take the ability to show somebody something new, extremely serious. Because if they're good, they are dictating the future of the music. If they're good. Quite a responsibility. Yeah, and they should they should be very, very, one, mindful of the responsibility and very, very careful with it because you can turn people off from music. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So the idea of figuring out what's good and why is it good, like, that's the reason why I love music. And that's the reason why I love all musics because I literally sit around trying to figure out why was the record made. Yeah. Good records, okay records, bad records. Why was the bad record made? Why did it come out bad? Okay, cool. That's going to, I'm going to learn something for that. Every record, <laughs> every record is important, whether we like them or we don't like them. Because if you don't have bad records, you won't be able to tell what's a good record. <laughs> True. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's so important to understand all of the music. So I listen to all music just so I can understand all of it. You know what I'm saying? I, I listen to a record, even like the whole world might think it's bad. I might think it's bad, but I can appreciate it because it gives, it gives me the ability to be able to differentiate. Okay. Why is it bad? Mm. Oh, it's bad because, and it didn't make you feel this way. That's why that record's, oh, okay, cool. Now I know I can appreciate it. I'll ne probably never play it again, but if I heard it, then I give it the ability to be appreciated. I think one of the cool things, too, in talking about introducing people to new music, and I think this is one of the things that's actually at the core of hip-hop and hip-hop DJing in particular, is is presenting something that's new and fresh, right? Uh, putting people onto new things, mm -hmm. being fresh, either how you dress, playing fresh music. Um, you know, I think that even when you look at breakbeats, right? These are songs and tracks that were either forgotten about or not celebrated in their own way, and then rediscovered and represented to the world and through the lens of, of DJs and mm -hmm. hip-hop. I think that that's such a beautiful thing, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we've musically 
shucks. Gave a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of artists, a whole bunch of writers, new money. <laughs> because I don't think Bob James knew what he was doing when he made Nautilus. I don't think he knew. Watch what this Mardi Gras does. <laughs> yeah. If you listen to Mardi Gras outside of the break, you're probably going, what? You know what I'm saying? Nautilus, the break comes in. At least with Nautilus, you can hear it that something's happening. With Mardi Gras, after the break, you're like, wait a minute. Wait, what just happened here? You know what I'm saying? But I don't think he was like, watch, yeah. watch, watch, watch. I swear to God, they're going to love this. No. You know what yeah. I mean? So I think, you know, our genre, though we sample a lot, though we reappropriate records, what we did, even though it wasn't appreciated in the beginning, later on was like, oh, hold up. I got a new revenue stream because you love my... I be, look, imagine if James Brown was still alive. How many artists would he just be walking up to going, thank you, brother. <laughs> Th brother, thank you. You know, because... The way he was sampled, the yeah. way Cool in the Gang is sampled, like or Roy Ayers or someone too. But yeah. like, yeah, but just imagine all of these guys that have been sampled in a way that literally do not have to work based off of samples. Yeah, that's true. We, I mean, there are artists who are performing again based off of what we did to their records. Yeah, it's been such a great journey. Like. uh discovering samples or mm -hmm. breakbeats and all, all through that. I think about how important the DJ has been in introducing all of that to, you know, the genre of hip hop and largely pop culture now as well. Everything is, you know, derived from hip hop breakbeats and loops and things like that. Uh, that's what we do. <laughs> yeah. That's what, uh, that's, that's what we do. We, uh, we lead the way and, and change it along the way. Absolutely. Now, um, one of the big questions I wanted to ask you specifically is what are some of the most pivotal DJ moments for you? For me personally? Yeah, for you personally. The first pivotal moment is the day I met Grandmaster Flowers and he let me DJ in Lincoln Terrace Park for what should have been two records. He let me play about 30 records. I don't, I don't know if it, he, he let me play about 30 to 40 minutes and it was supposed to be one record or two records. And, um, that night, I was I was like eleven or about yeah eleven about to be twelve. I went home to my grandmother and I said I'm gonna be a, be a DJ for the rest of my life. And she said it's okay, but you gotta finish school. <laughs> so like the only reason I went to school was because of her saying that because I believed that if I didn't I wouldn't have been a DJ. So you know like she was that important to me that she said that and I was like damn I gotta finish school. So I, I went and I finished school, but like all through it, she never discouraged the fact that I was making this noise in her house, you know. And then um, the next, again, I go back to Red Alert um, giving me one o'clock as a DJ was like the second most important. There were things that happened like when I became Dana Dane's DJ, I traveled the world as a DJ. Oh, that, that's cool. But in, like being able to play on a radio or those are those are really good moments but the things that turn those moments up was red alert giving me one o'clock like you know yes i'm on a radio yes my name is getting known yes people know who i am yes i could play but being put on the other stage by someone like red alert is the thing the you know be, being given 30 minutes to play in a park jam when you're 11 with literally the greatest mixing DJ ever, you know what I'm saying, is like, for me. Yeah, talk about like flowers, like how did that, uh, that moment come to be? Because Pete was there, Pete DJ Jones was there, and he was like, that's the little kid from up the street who could DJ. And he was like, you could DJ? We're at a park jam and he's playing and it's dark. And he goes, you could DJ? And I was like, yes. And he's looking at me like, oh, you're pretty, Right, I, he's like, you want to play a record? I think he thought I was going to say no. And I was like, yes. And he was like, okay, find some. And he's got like 20 crates and I'm going through the crates and I'm pulling up records and he's going, he's mixing, but he's turning back and he's going, you know, these records. And I was like, yes. So now he's like, and Pete's like, 
And I'm like, so he lets me try. And he like, keep going, keep going, keep going. And I'm like, oh no, I think you're like the greatest. Like, and you're letting me keep going? Oh yeah, I'm gonna do this forever. What a massive cosign. Uh, imagine that. We look at it like a massive cosign, but he was just like, let's see. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and, you know, later on, you could look at it like a massive cosign, but the massive cosign is, I heard you. Now I'm going to tell everybody. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. True. You know what I'm saying? Not the, oh, I let it happen. You know what I'm saying? That's like, that's like the way I cosign Mel Star. You know, like, you can't cosign anybody until they, until you've heard them do something and then you can walk away and go talk about it. You know what I mean? That's the cosign. Like, mm -hmm. nah, he's this deal. You know, like I used to cosign Scratch. Scratch, yeah. me and Scratch DJ together since we were like 10 and 11. Wow. He used to be in my house every day. We're cutting and scratching together. Like we came up on the same block together. Like it's not a fluke that we were two of the most deadly in Brooklyn because we were together every day in my house so when it became time for him to be in a dj battle and i'm one of the hosts of the dj battle as soon as dj battle starts i go to the front of the stage and i go by the way i'm dj clock can and i'm glad thanks for everybody for coming my brother dj scratch is gonna win this battle <laughs> and people were like the fuck are you talking about and scratch is with his confidence like mm-hmm bust all y'all ass and then he busts everybody ass so it wasn't even like it was a bias it was just like i just believed and my guy like that. And then he busts everybody's ass. But like, it wasn't even like a, yeah, you guys are biased when you're judging. It was so clear that it was like, yeah, nah, he didn't, he, he, he didn't, he didn't sway any judges. He just meant that, you know? I co-signed the guys, I co-signed the guys that I actually saw and understand could do it. Like, oh no, Plastic Man, uh, Miz, Muggs, um, Aladdin, like these guys that I co-signed really, R Richie Rich. Like yeah. I didn't co-sign no scrubs. <laughs> co co-sign Hove. There's yeah. no scrubs. Sauce money, no scrub. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like the co-signs, if I'm handing out a co-sign, it's because the talent's actually there. Yeah. And your name obviously means, you know, hopefully so much. Hopefully. I, I guess that's, I guess because my co-signs have come of people that people walk away going, oh shit, that, they can go, okay, if he co-signs, then maybe they really are that deal. But like, I really listen so much that I really don't think I'm going to miss if I co-sign something, you know? In a way, I feel like that's almost like DJing though, right? You got, you know, you know that this is going to be a hot record, you know? Yeah. And you believe in it. Right. And then you co-sign it. Right. And play and it. And you have to make it work a certain yeah. way. Like if you ask the brand Nubians, they'll tell you I played their record before everybody else. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Which but record? As soon as a uh, uh, brand Nubian. Okay. Brand new, brand new. Yeah, 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 that yeah. was their first record. Da, da, da. And they brought it to the station. And I was like, is nobody listening to this shit? And I was like, oh, I'm going on first record on the radio. Bam, bam, bam. I'm cutting it up. And I'm, then the shit starts to go. And I'm just like, yeah, no, but this shit is fire. How did y'all miss this? You know what I mean? But, you know, there's so many records that I was like, soon as like, I, I would get to the station an hour early. So that means I had an hour to listen to all of the music that came at the front door. Yes, we got records at the radio every night, but I was at the front door with records coming in because there were so many people giving records. So that hour beforehand, I'm listening to the records. Do I like it? Do I like it? Do I like it? And you only got, you know, 15 to 20 seconds for each record, but at least I'm trying to figure out if I got something new. Yeah. You know, I remember one night I was remixing um, Spread My Wings, right? In the next room is Public Enemy. And um, I go in there and I'm talking to Chuck and then he lets the record play. I got so much trouble on my mind. And I was like, can I have a cassette? He was like, for what? So I'm going to the radio station right now. My show starts at nine o'clock. Give me a cassette. He gives me a cassette right out the gate. Acapella, acapella beginning. Yeah. I had so much trouble on my mind. Refute. Radio station line goes crazy. It's the, the PD because they were having issues with public. Me. Get that shit off the radio right now. Rewind. Play it again. <laughs> play it again. <laughs> Shit's going crazy. I'm like, this has got to be one of the best rap records I ever heard. And I just, I think I played shit like five times in a row. Radio, the, the warm line was going crazy. The PD is like, you got to turn that record off. 
And every time the shit rings, Molly's like, I know it's, I know they're calling, but you gotta do what you're doing. And I just thought the record was fucking amazing. You know uh, what I'm saying? And it's funny because I still got that cassette and yeah. that version never came out. Oh, really? No, nah, it never came out with that intro. Mm. You know, because if you listen to the record, it has a beat at the beginning and then it goes, I got so much trouble. This, and then there's a version of on, on the record that where it goes, I got so much trouble. Hit the drum and get wicked. And it's just a break. No, right. mine's had the acapella at the top and then the record kept going. Wow. So I have this cassette that does that. And I just was like, nah, this, this shit's fucking flyer. So, so it's like you had to, you had to be chest testing and trying and, and trying to figure out what's going to be the next shit or, you're wasting one your power yeah you know what i'm saying djing it, it, there's a lot of uh power in it mm. you know and, and and if you can make a difference selection wise then you're you should be able to last longer than the guy who just plays some records yeah i mean that goes all the way back to what you're saying what larry said like put the music first yeah if if it's not about the music you should just not do it yeah and, 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 and again, like, it's, it's a lot, a lot of DJs because I ask the question all the time, you know, like, what's the most important? And 99% of the time, somebody says something that's not music and I'm just like, you'll never be great. Mm. I, I can look at it and go, you're never going to be great. Mm. But, you know, I keep it to myself. But like, when I ask the question, if that's not your answer, I'm already thinking you're not going to be great. Yeah. And I want you to be great. I want all DJs to be great because this is my craft. Mm. I don't look at it like it's our craft. I look at it like it's my craft. Like you should look at it like it's your craft. Mm. Like every DJ should look at it like this thing belongs to you. Mm. It is so much power and it's a lot of responsibility and you should give a damn before the shit goes away. Mm. Because the brands are trying to make it simple for people to be DJs. Mm -hmm. So while they're doing that, you better be as effective as you possibly can with your responsibility and your power. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about um, your relationship with, with DJ Scratch. You talked about coming up together. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you're also a very big part of the Battle for World Supremacy. Yeah, from um, the beginning. From the beginning, yeah. yeah. Now you talked a little bit about when he when Scratch won in yeah. 1988, uh -huh. but you were also a big supporter of him in his career as well. Yeah. like. <laughs> um, yeah, like after he won the battle, like right after, I was like, you need a rap group. You need a rap group. I don't give a fuck. Somebody need to have you DJ for him so you can get on the road. You can, and, you know, right after that, he became EPMD's DJ. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's not a, it's not a, a fluke that uh -huh. he became a DJ. They needed a DJ. And what's funny is their DJ at the time was a really good DJ. And then, I guess he couldn't go on the road or whatever, but so they needed a DJ. So he, you should go. Like they asked you to go, go. When he comes back off the road, I was just like, he would ask me like, yo, how, 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 did, how did you get that new car? How did you get that new chain? How'd you get, yo, you gotta start producing. Mm. Never paid it any attention. Keep going on the road, keep going on the road, come back, I got a newer car. Yo, you gotta start producing. And lo and behold, as soon as he start banging that machine, Shit got different for him. So I would always look at it and go, if my brother's in trouble, so am I. Mm. I. I literally lived that way. Like, if my brother's in trouble, so am I. Scratches my brother. He wasn't in trouble, but my thing is, if I got some game and I don't give it to you, then I'm a piece of shit. Mm. It's especially as, as tight as we are. You know what I'm saying? Like, so you just got to share it. I shared it with everybody who was a Superman DJ. Like, I shared it with the X-Men. I shared yeah. it. Yes. Like there, if you ask the original X-Men, they can tell you, I sat them down at a meeting and asked to manage them. Oh, really? I didn't know. I know you got no issues with the X-Men. Yeah. No, I love, I loved hearing no, this. I, like I love them guys. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think they're fucking amazing. I sat them down at a place called America and in, invited them to, 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 to lunch and said, guys, let me manage you. If I don't make you more money in two months than you've made all year, fire me. I begged. I was like, I think you guys are fucking amazing. Let me manage you. All of my crew is doing all right. I know you guys can do well. Like, let me manage you. It didn't, it didn't go that way, I guess, because they, they had a rivalry thing, probably. Maybe that's the reason why. I, I didn't give a fuck about that shit. I gave a fuck about the craft and the, the business of. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I thought that they should be looking at the business of as much as possible because it could take care of them for the rest of their lives. You know? So that's love. Not I, and I will try to do my best to do that for any DJ that has any bones about him. You know? Yeah. This is gotta say big up DJ Scratch one time though. Like Oh nah, Scratch is like I used to call him Jesus Christ of turntables and people would be like, What? I'm like, no, trust me. It, he's he's dang we still <laughs> when we were young, we used to find out about a block party, go to the block party, stand in front of the DJ booth and be like, we want a battle. <laughs> we want a battle. <laughs> we would battle people on their sets Damn. all over the place. That would be our shit. Stand in front of them like, yo, we want a battle. Yo, we want a battle. I, me I met Richie Rich battling Richie Rich on his set. <laughs> Wow. And in his neighborhood, you couldn't tell Richie Rich wasn't the, he wasn't the motherfucker. I'm standing in front of his shit. What's up? You want a battle? What's up? You at a block party? Like the nerve, the nerve that me and Scratch had. We went everywhere in Brooklyn and stood in front of people's battles and set some like, yo, you want a battle? Yo, you want a battle? Every crew didn't matter. It was me and him. We're going to take down all of Brooklyn by ourselves wow. on your set. That was the way we walked around and, you know. Luckily, we, we were really, really good. Yeah. You know. I mean, I guess you'd figure out pretty quickly one way or another if you weren't, right? <laughs> yeah, but I think half of it might have been attitude. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Half of it might have been, no, we, we just believe we're untouchable. Let's go. Like, to me, if you walk up on somebody on a set and tell them, what's up, you want to battle? I mean, if that shit happened to me, I'd probably be like, wait, he's not going to do that unless he's dangerous, right? I could be dead wrong. Yeah. But He's not going to do that unless he's dangerous. Ooh, we went everywhere and did it. So we had to be dangerous. Yeah. And, and battle DJ. I mean, talk about a little bit about the, you know, the battle for world supremacy and, and your involvement in it. Like what was the, what was some big learnings for you from that? Or what were some of your big takeaways from doing that? Um, I literally only did it for one reason. I just wanted DJs to get their shine. Mm -hmm. I wanted DJs to get loved the way rappers were getting loved. You know what I'm saying? Cause you know, Yes, some of the things that I did in my career afforded me the ability to get love around the world. Like me DJing for Dana Dane made me go on the road. So from city to city to city to city to city, I get this moment in the show where I get to go off. So if I go off by the end of the show, I'm just as famous as Dana Dane. So cool. I get that. But when I come back and I see a bunch of DJs that have a certain skill set, but they don't get the love, they don't get to shine the same way what what can i do to make sure that they shine a certain way mm. oh we're having battles over here okay cool i'm gonna help you with this because you're gonna pick terrible djs so i'm gonna help you get good mm. djs and then at some point you don't think it's lucrative enough now i gotta do it on my own mm. i didn't even think twice i was like oh okay cool the battle's mine now so now i own the battle and i'm gonna go find djs and what do i do i put the feelers out around the world instead of around a couple of states so now i got DJs from Japan, DJs from Denmark, DJs from everywhere coming to New York to have to be in this battle during the New Music Seminar. And I just wanted everybody to get some shine. I just wanted DJs to to get a look. Because really what you you kind of laid the, the groundwork, the foundation for what a lot of other, you know, obviously the DMC continued on. DMC, ITF. It, what's crazy is the DMC was there. It's just that it was exactly what it was called the disco mix right. club. Like if you knew about those battles, there were seven minutes of disco mixing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, here's a minute and a half. Let me see if you can do something that kills this other guy. Right. That's to me, like, let's go, you know, let, let's do that. And, um, so, so the battles that became after that were primarily based off of what we were doing. You know what I'm saying? I would look at DMC as it became more of a cutting and scratching battle going, Seven minutes is just too long. Right. If you can't figure it out in, in seven minutes, then something's no good. Mm. Do I think I've seen amazing performances in DMC? Yes. But those performances were like right at the same time we were doing this. Cause those were like the best performances to me because they weren't based off of the technology that was sitting in front of you. It was based off of, can you really do that? Mm. You know, like cash money in the DMC was fucking remarkable yeah like it was like yo do you see how funky he is yeah. you know what i'm saying i was i was just like a lot of being 
a great so-called turntable is because I don't I don't necessarily subscribe to the word. <laughs> sure. I'm like, are you a DJ or not? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I, I understand what happened. They wanted to separate it and give themselves or give that style of DJing a, a name. Cool. If the musicality isn't there, I I I don't care. Mm. Like I don't I don't care how technically sound you think you are. If the musicality isn't there, I don't care. Because DJing is based off of the music. So what you're doing better come out musical. Other so like when I hear Rob Swift, I'm like, yes. You see how funky that is? You know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, yeah, like okay. Yeah. Just be funky. Be musical. Let let the shit that you're doing make me go. Yes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like Got to shout out Rob Swift too cuz he's Rob always Swift's fucking amazing. Yeah, always approached it with like a, like an instrument, you know, like But it is an instrument. Yeah. This and you can tell when it's an extension of your person, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think you touched on something that I really wanted to expand upon and it was uh talking about giving the DJ shine, you know, what you were trying to do with the Battle for World Supremacy mm-hmm. and I think um, you know, in in the context of hip hop history, you know, the DJ started out as as the main attraction, mm-hmm. you know, the head of the whole situation. And over the years, you've seen them take a less of a of a, I guess, a priority. And the rapper often has taken the main stage. You, it, the funny thing is, that I, I want to be clear: they didn't take a a, a a a a step back when rappers got record deals. The companies were leaving them out of the deals, uh, so they got pushed to the side. Yeah, I'd love to hear a bit more about that because, you know, obviously, I'm sure you have a very unique perspective on that, you know, seeing well, it happen. I, it's weird because at that point, then it becomes how the artist is going to treat his partner. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Are you going to treat it like we're a group and we're going to get signed? Are you going to treat it like just because they say they only want the rapper or the rapper should get signed? Then it becomes how do you treat the group? Because you have the ability to say, no, we're a unit. Like mm. Run DMC said, no. We're a unit. Gangstar. Gangstar. Yeah. We're a unit. Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Yeah. We're a unit. It's not, you can get the rapper and I'll just go do shows. You know what I'm saying? It's like a group. Right. Like I wasn't part of Dana Dane from the beginning. Right. I became his DJ. But the first Jay-Z record says Jay-Z and DJ Clark Kent. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because we were a group. I, I wasn't, a, we weren't a group for long because I became an executive and whatever but if it's important to the rapper to make sure that his partner is included then that gets done Mm. when you don't let that be the case that's not on the company anymore it's on the guy it's on the artist you can't sit there and just be like oh the company said they can only sign the rapper no that's not true the the rap the company if they want the rapper they're gonna do what they gotta do so if you say i need i need my dj along with me you know, cash money and marvelous. It wasn't a, a one guy thing. No. Do you think though that uh, in any way, and this is in no way trying to like bait or clickbait or anything, but do you feel like um, the 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 majority of popular culture has the same respect for the DJ, or is it, do they value the the artist more? Do you how do you see that dynamic these days? Well, think think about this. When when an artist makes a song, who who who's the artist? Right. The rapper is the artist, so they're looking at the they're looking at what they get until the rapper makes sure that it's important that the DJ gets his shine. So that's why you have so many DJs now making their records or mm. or, or or being the the feature. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like Metro Boomin is a DJ. He's making records. Y'all come be on my records. After he made a bunch of records for people, he's like, now it's time for y'all to be on my records. Dave Getta, come be on my records. Yeah. You know what I mean? So because they know that there's a place for them you know they're like it the question is whether you just want the place or not yeah it's interesting though because we're talking like we're talking about djing and, and i really do want to talk about music production as well mm-hmm. specifically the role of a producer um because obviously you know you're you're very experienced in both djing and production yes and you know uh let's just state some facts here you worked with the greats you know you've produced records for mariah carey jay-z biggie kanye west you, you know some of my favorite records are produced by DJ Clark Kent. So, um, you know, thank I, you. <laughs> like that's that's a that's a fucking honor, <laughs> man. I think a lot of people, anyone who loves hip hop, would know that. But um, 
I do have to do, do want to ask specifically about one of my favorite Jay Z songs, and we talked a bit a, a little bit about it earlier, uh, Brooklyn's Finest mm-hmm. featuring pre, featuring Biggie. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to know, like, I, I mean, I think I've heard you you talk about this before, but I'd love to to talk to you about it personally, um, because obviously the sample it, the sample is a very unique sample, mm-hmm. and I'd love to know how the DJing part of you influenced the production of that record specifically. Um. It's funny because it's one of the hardest records to mix. Like, like if you, it, it's so awkward because it's a five bar turnaround that it's hard to mix until you realize, okay, mix it for five bars. So that even makes it weirder if you're trying to rap to it. Yeah. But the record itself is literally my favorite record that I've ever heard. Ohio Players Ecstasy to me is the best record I've ever heard. It, it doesn't, it doesn't have verses. It doesn't have hooks. It doesn't have bridges. It just has feeling. Yeah. And every time I listen to it, it's the same. It's just like, God, listen to the feeling. And, uh, I played it every night after at every party I played. I played it as the last record at every party. And you know, when you got your crew, Jay and Dame and Biggs and all of me around you every night, they hear this song at the end of the night, it becomes the crew's favorite record. Yeah. And then it becomes, yo, we, yo, we might as well make something off of that. So Dame was like, yo, hook up that beat. And then you, you put it in front of Jay, who's already like, yeah, this is one of our favorite records. And then it's a beat for him. And then it's like, He's such a talented guy. He sat there to figure out what happens in that fifth bar. And he figured out the fifth bar is a turnaround to start a new set of four bars. So it's like, it's almost like a give yourself a breather and come back. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So he figured that out. When you loop it on four bars, it's terrible. When you loop it on two bars, it's terrible. When you loop it on three, it's terrible. Three is is just fucking disgusting. But when you loop it on five, it's like, wow, that's the feeling. Because the turnaround is so important to the other four bars. So it's like the turnaround is the reason why the record is good. It really is, man. I just I was gonna say, like, first of all, thank you for putting me onto the Ohio Players record because without your song, I wouldn't know about the original sample. A, a, a lot of people wouldn't know about it. Yeah, but in my house, that was just one of the funk records that played. Yeah, and I literally thought it was one of the best songs I ever heard, like from the beginning. Yeah, my uncle used to play it, and I used to be like, "That is beautiful." Like, it really I, is. My heart, I would be like, "That's fucking beautiful." Like, it's literally the best record to me oh yeah you can feel it like it, yeah, it, it hits your right that, that's the thing yeah. you can feel it and i mean again it doesn't have a a, a, a verse it doesn't have a, a a hook it doesn't have a bridge it's just a ball of emotion yeah you know what i'm saying and like yeah yeah man it's 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 a perfect record and you know what else i, I just want to like make a a bit of an observation here you know, and, and classic hip hop beats, in my opinion. This is just in my opinion here, but odd, like phrasing beats, five bar loops or seven bar loops or three bar loops. You got some, you're in like the canon of some of the best hip hop beats ever made, in my opinion. You got Thank your, you. your track, Brooklyn's Finest. You got Electric Relaxation by Tribe Called Quest. You got They Less All Stakes Is High. These are all like. No, oh, Stakes Is High? <laughs> <laughs> when I, taught my son about De La Soul. I literally played stakes as high like 15 times. And he's going, why you keep playing this song over? I said, it's literally, it's the best De La Soul record in the world. And he just was like, no, nah, I think it's so. I was like, no, no, you're going to come back. It might be a year from now. It might be 10 years from now. And you're going to go, I get it. Year later, he was like, dad, I get it. And I was like, yes, you can listen to that shit. I mean, first, and, and then the verses are just fucking creep. The De La Soul is one of the best rap groups ever, but mm-hmm. that record. Yeah, God tier. I don't think, I, I don't know if they could do a better record than that. Like, not to say that there's anything wrong with the records that they've made because they made a ton of stellar records, but that one, 
Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm telling you, the first time I heard, da, na, 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 I was like, oh my God. Like, and this is like no beat drop. I just was like, this is going to be incredible. I mean, because I got to put a needle in a groove. I put a needle in a groove and was like, what the, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I just was like, yeah, that's you, the fact that you said stakes is high. And I think stakes is high is their best record. Is it? Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. I'm, I, I like I happily sit there and count the bars just to talk to talk it through with people because like it, I find that it just so. I don't know. It's amazing. It's, mm -hmm. There's no other way to put it. It's amazing that these records exist and the musicality of it is so unique and original yeah. and refreshing. And, uh, you know, like, and also, you know, to, like you said about Jay rapping on Brooklyn's Finest, the, the cadence, how do you rap on these beats? How do you make it sound and flow? And mm -hmm. it's not just spitting a 16 bar, you know, verse. You can't just copy and paste something. You got to write to it and it's got to, it's got to mean something. So, Hearing your context on Brooklyn's Finest, hearing how Jay Z approached it, hearing how important it was to your crew, I mean, that, I love this. I love. I live for that. I love hearing that. You mm -hmm. know, and it bring it makes that that song so much more special. Obviously, for you guys as well. Yeah. Now, I also know, um, and I hope if, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear about your story um, about the hook on that. If you don't mind repeating it, because um, the Biggie laid his verse his verses the night before we had to master the album. So Jay's there and he goes, yo, I'm, I'll be back. Biggie lays his verses, yo, I'll be back. And I'm like, Jay, before he leaves, I'm like, Jay, we need a hook. Scratch something. I was like, no, you gotta come back. We gotta figure out a hook. Biggie's leaving and he, I was like, yo, you think you got a hook? He was like, nah, I mean, you know, you." he leaves. Time is going. I'm trying to scratch everything in the world. And because the music has so much music in it, everything sounded terrible. Mm. And I, it, it, it got to a point where I thought to myself, maybe I should call Prem. Maybe he'll be able to figure out a rhythm to it or scratch or whatever. Because I didn't necessarily care about scratching. I cared about, is it going to be right? So I got the Brooklyn, Brooklyn part. And I was like, yeah, but there's nothing else. I scratched everything. I scratched rep represent BK to the fullest. It was so different drum wise from the record that it just sound everything sounded bumpy. Everything sounded bumpy. Mm. And nothing had acapellas. So it was just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I I would I kept calling Jay. I was like, yo, dog, we need a hook. Yo, scratch something. Big. You think you can yo, man, yo, ask Jay. <laughs> just like. So I just start writing but i i i'm not a rapper you know like stone cold we had conversations and jay was like you're not no rapper and i was like never i don't want to be a fucking rapper i don't want to do what you do that's it i don't want to be a rapper understandably <laughs> you know why i never want to be a rapper because of jay-z yeah yeah I could because of jay-z jazz and sauce <laughs> because they were so amazingly good that I would want to be that good. Mm. And I was like, I'm never going to be that good. So I, f I felt like I would be fucking killing myself to try to even be able to think that way. Because the shit they were saying was, I, I mean, Sauce Money said, I'm quick to put Shorty in a bind. I wreck a disco in San Fran with a Cisco or 40 and a nine. And I was like, what? Yeah. I was like, I, I would never. I, how could you get how did you get that you know science jazzo one day said a mont blanc the paper satellite iridium and i was like what are you talking about dog <laughs> like i mont blanc oh you mont blanc the paper make calls satellite iridium oh oh like i can't think that way musically i could do some shit but like i can't think that way right and then jay with i talk jewels and spit diamonds i'm all cherry like a hymen when i'm rhyming with remarkable timing what you know the, I, I got a song where jay said i press more i press more skirts than a cleaners it sounds simple <laughs> until you hear it and then you're like oh shit i press more skirts he's talking about girls than a cleaners oh yeah he's wild yeah hold so on. i was just like i i can't think that way so i never want to be a rapper but now i gotta sit here and write try to write something so the the 
the first line of the hook comes from one of Jay's first lines. Jay-Z, Biggie Smalls, nigga, shit your draws. Brooklyn represents y'all, hit your fours. Marcy, you don't stop. bed you won't stop, niggas. Then it comes back again, so I pick another spot of Brooklyn. Another part of Brooklyn. So now I got four parts of Brooklyn, but now I got to get four parts of Brooklyn in every hook. So I'm like, okay, cool. Who do I pick? Who do I don't pick? Cool. I go in the booth. First thing I say to the engineer is, can you change the way my voice sounds? I said, because if they find out it's me, I'm done. So he did what he could. Record comes out. I'm, oh, record's done. Dame, I, Dame is going to master. And I'm like, Dame, please don't tell them that it's me. He was like, I don't worry about it. He goes to mastering. They master the song. They call in like, yo, we like this shit is fire. Jay's like, who's that? I was like, just some kids I got from outside. <laughs> He's like, oh, shit, now nah, shit is fire. Okay, cool. I'm in my house like, yes, because I'm believing he's going to find out it's me and it's not going to get on the album. Damn. That's it. I, I just know this song is never getting on the album. Nothing gets said. Album comes out. Three weeks after the album comes out. Yo, Clock, who is this? Dame goes, oh, that's Clock. <laughs> it blew up your spot. You ain't no fucking rapper. <laughs> you don't rap. I, I swear, like, imagine you got a record. You love the record. I rap on the record. But you were screaming at me about not being a rapper. And I'm going, I know, I know I'm not a rapper. No, no, I'm not a rapper. But, <laughs> like, you guys left me in the studio with nothing. And was like, scratch something. Listen to every, listen to it. It came out right. Yeah, but you ain't no rapper. About a month later, it's a show at the Apollo Junior Mafia and um and Jay. J Junior Mafia is opening for Jay. Yep. Lost. Was you at that show at the Apollo? You was at that show, right? When I had to do the hook for Junior for um Brooklyn's finest? Yo, I'm at the side of the stage. I'm like, oh shit, they're gonna do Brooklyn's finest. And Big's like, yeah, you gonna come on. I'm like, no. <laughs> they get to the work to the hook part, and Big's like, come on. And then I got the mic and I'm like, please see big small thing. Shit. Crowd goes crazy. I'm just like, oh shit. So I'm still off to the side and I'm trying to go back off. And then the next hook comes. By the time the next hook comes, I'm in the middle of the stage. Jay Z, <laughs> never again. Like never again. Like wow. I was just like, I can't do that. That's awesome. What a moment though. Yeah, it was a great moment. That was that was a great moment. I wouldn't do it again. So this is the only song you're featured on vocally. No. No, I, I I did another one. We're not gonna talk about it. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. But I I, I wouldn't again. It's funny because there's a video for that too. That's the shit that makes it even crazier. <laughs> and I got reamed for it. Didn't we tell you ain't no rap? <laughs> <laughs> it's just what happened. It's just what happened. You know, yeah. they I, same thing happened. Yeah, I just would. I'd love to just like kind of get your take on why you think DJs and, and who are maybe some of your favorite DJs that are also producers and why it works. Why is that combo such a potent combo? Well, I, I think as a DJ, if you play enough and if you're creative DJ wise, that um, something at some point says, I want to make the records mm. that get played. Mm. I guess, I figure. Um, but uh, some of my favorite DJs that are producers or producers that are DJs or DJs that are producers. Yeah, good question. Uh, DJ Premier. Right. He's. Yeah. Mount Rushmore. <laughs> yeah. He's the best rap producer, period. Dr. Drake, uh, DJ Quick. Yeah. DJ Quick is amazing. Like, amazing producer. And amazing DJ, too. Right? He's very good DJ. Yeah. Very good DJ. Uh, Battle Cat is a very good DJ. Um, Scratch. Fuck. What are we talking about? DJ Scratch. Um, I mean, shit. I guess I could. Molly Ma is the reason <laughs> that hip hop or rap producers who do boom bap rap, th he is all of our father. Yeah. Like he is the father to all hard rap producers whether they know it or they don't he is our sensei I totally agree he is <sighs> molly dropping ma. off the drums too right that was the same molly ma is 
he built the mountain that could be Mount Rushmore. Yeah, right. Like if, like if you were putting four dudes on that mountain, the person who built the mountain would be Molly Mock. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I think I think I literally could probably stop right at Molly Mock. But I gotta say, my favorite is is DJ Premier. He's he's vicious. Um, Chuck's DJs that are producers: Lil Louis Vega, Kenny Dope. Um, that I think are like amazing. Um, Spinner. Yeah. He's dope. Shout out DJ Spinner. He's dope. That boy love music too. Yeah. That's another one that when you, when he plays, you can go, he gets it. Yeah. And also similar to, to yourself and, 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 and what, you know, from the school of Larry, right? He plays mm-hmm. everything. He can play everything really well. Because he cares. Because he loves music. Like you can hear yeah. it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You can hear it in the way that he plays. Like, it, he's one of those to me. Yeah. Spinner's one of those to me. Rich Medina. Yeah. One of those to me. You know what I'm saying? Stretch. Yeah. Stretch is one of those to me. Like, he, I, it was, it was a time in Stretch's career that I would like, oh, we're re- really actually real friends. You know what I'm saying? Not like, you know, just because we DJ together, friends like, no, we're real, actual friend, friend, friends. It was a time when he was doing a lot of house events, a lot of house parties, and he was mm-hmm. playing house clubs and all of that, a lot. Didn't he have a house le- label too? Was it Plant Life or something like yes. that? Yes. Yeah. But I literally called him Euro Stretch for about two <laughs> years. Like, it was a joke. Like, I was like, dog, you, you don't even love rap no more. You don't love hip hop no more. You, you, you're a Euro stretch. And it was a joke, but it was because he loved the music. And like Stretch got a real dope education. Mm. You know, Stretch, his first club was Mars. Oh, okay. I was the resident at Mars. And you came to my floor, you heard rock, you heard house, you heard disco, you heard rap, you heard everything. So he was coming to my floor going, what the fuck is happening here? Like when I was at Mars, it was anything goes. Like anything goes. Cause it was at a time when people actually wanted to party, party, party. So, yes, you would hear me play house. You would hear me play disco. You'd hear me play R&B, soul, funk, whatever, in the midst of playing rap. But, like, you would hear more of the other than you would hear rap. Like, that's me. Like, I'm going to play more of the other because rap was necess- was generally on the radio. You're going to hear that shit anyway. You ain't going to hear all of this other shit. Like, imagine coming to... Mars and hearing Heartbreak Hotel by Michael Jackson. You'll be like, Wait, how did we get here? <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm playing that. Yeah. And clubs will go crazy. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Stretch though. Um, cause let's talk about the originals. You got Stretch, Rich Medina, Tony mm-hmm. Touch, D yeah. Nice, and me. Yeah. Tell, how, tell me about the, how that came about. Like, how did you guys decide? Super accident. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Um, when Sandy happened, the storm. Oh, yeah. Um, there was a, a, a fundraiser put together that, that happened at Santos and six DJs were on the bill. It was us five and Q-Tip and most deaf was the host. And, um, uh, the party was nuts, like nuts. The party was super dope. So one day the owner of the club just, Hey Clark, you know, that party was really crazy. Um, you want to do it again? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, yeah, all you guys get together and just do this party again. Let's see if we do it again. So what I do, I pick up the phone and I start calling everybody. One, five, one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Dog, call me back. Yo, call me back. Yo. Fuck, you ain't calling me back. <laughs> all right, click. I go back. I go, only five of us are down because I can't get in touch with Q-Tip. Oh. Okay, so oh shit, what are we gonna call this party? The guy says, Well, you were five of the originals that were there from the beginning. I was like, call it the originals. And they were like, What? I said, Yeah, call the party the originals. He was just like oh. I was like, Yeah, don't worry about it, just call it the originals. I get together, call it we are we're all talking about it. Tony is the guy who's like the club setter upper, right? I'm like, we're going to call it the originals. And I was like, okay, bet. First party happens, bananas. But before the party, I was like, let's go to dinner, guys. 
right? So we go to dinner and I sit down, we're at dinner and I was like, we all love and respect each other. You know, like I had separate relationships with everybody. Each one of us all had certain kind of relationships with each other. And I said, this can be dope if we leave our egos at the door. I said, we gotta make this party a party where we just got to go and have fun and make sure everybody feels the fun that we're having. Mm. So the first party basically felt like we were just DJing to just be DJing for us to have fun. So the idea was you're going to come in here, five DJs who are friends have fun. And that's what it's been from that day. The party was so good. People were walking away going, we felt the fun you were having. And you can go to an originals party and hear two rap records. Or you can go to an originals party and hear 50. You can go to an originals party and hear 30 house records. Or you can hear one. Or you can hear none. You never know what you're going to get. And you got five. You go to, like, the originals just felt like the best basement party ever. And we just was like, we're just going to do it every month. And it's just going to, we're going to call it our night off. <laughs> so it was our night off where we just got to go and freestyle and uh that's just what happened and that and it works because of the of the lunch of the dinner that we had leave your ego right here and never go get it again you know what i mean so we left it everybody plays the way that they play but it's for the greater good yeah you know what i'm saying like it, it could be a time when if there's a lull somebody will come and be like clock bang the club okay cool i'll bang the club yo rich hit him with that and we set it so it's like everybody gets prime time. Oh, nice. it's, it's half hour sets and they rotate, right? But it could be, you could be five minutes into your set and if you feel like, yo, stretch, hit them with some, right? If you stop, let them go. Why? Because if the feeling says do it a certain way, just, just fucking do it. Like it's for the, it's for our, it's for us to have fun. Yeah. And I think that's a really, like a great realistic expectation, you know, like not, not every night's going to be your best night. That's unrealistic, right? And, having the, the support of your of people that you respect and your friends right it's going to be for the best of everybody and sometimes you right. just want to sit back and enjoy your friends killing it hell yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i've i've heard people say oh, i don't know man i don't know if your man's gonna and i'll be like yo just wait just wait my man's gonna and then he'll come on bang the club and then you're just like you, you, you didn't because you never heard of him it's the first time you've been in the originals you never heard of him you ain't think he's gonna watch Watch what my man does. Yes. You know, and the, the thing is, the, the one thing I, I feel great about is that, one, we came together almost by accident, but we're all so our own person that when we come together, it just feels like super fucking cool. And then, yes, we each had relationships, but now... It's not relationships anymore. It's a brotherhood. So each of our kids matter to each other. Each of our families matter to each other. Everything that's happening in our lives, we all know. So it's like these five brothers are actually really brothers. And, you know, blood makes you related, but love makes you a family. And, it's really and we're a family. That's really true, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that does that and in relation to music too like people can really pick up on that you know if mm -hmm. you're really connected and really on the same wavelength when you're performing there's a certain like energy that's being transmitted you know through the, the the way you're playing your songs whether it's through the mic you know if you're a vocalist i guess but as a dj through the way you're playing your music what makes me a good dj is my energy I play records with energy so you can take 10 records if you give me the same 10 records I can literally blindly promise they're going to feel different when I play them because 99% of DJs are going to play them from a skill set instead of an energy set. Mm. My thing is, give me the 10 records. You can do whatever you want to do to them. I'll play the same 10 records and they're going to be in the goddamn ceiling when I'm done because I'm going to play with energy. Mm. I make the people feel what I feel musically through the way it gets played. If you're not trying to make that crowd 
walk away with the same love for the music that you are, that you have, then you don't have the energy. Mm. You're thinking, oh, these are the records that they love and you play them. And I'm like, I'm gonna play records that you think they don't love and it's gonna feel better than what you just did because the energy. Yeah. I can really tell like that you like that's ex that that is like so much a part of your approach to DJ and how much you love and how much you care about the culture through this conversation and, and from yeah. obviously your career is like it's the music man it's the music it's yeah the fucking music if it's not the music go home like get off of the set go, go do it in your bedroom man make your mixtapes like don't 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 come out and play for people if it ain't about the music because then you're selfish mm. You're selfish. The music is for everybody. And if you're not getting the music to everybody, you're fucking selfish. And you should not have those two letters. You should not be able to use it. You shouldn't. Like, it, those letters are being fucking abused. It's a bunch of motherfuckers using the letters who can't fucking play. Mm. Yo, let it go, dog. Let it go. Give. Get, get his shit back. Mm. I've been asked a hundred times to make a playlist. I've never made a playlist. I mix. <laughs> what? Yeah. I'm a DJ. I, ca I can't make a playlist. I have to mix the records. The records have to be mixed. Otherwise, I'm not being a DJ. If you can't tell that I love the music in the way that I played, then I failed you. Mm. I just refuse to fail anybody when it comes to the music. I adore it. It should, yeah. It's it saved me. The music saved me. Not yeah. the craft, the music. That's what saved me. That's what saved me. Yeah, I think it's uh, responsible for saving a lot of people too, right? Yeah, I just don't know if they realize it or not. Yeah. You know. I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent now. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, where do you see DJing going? You know, we've obviously been talking a lot about the history of DJing, the, you know, the DJing history of, and hip hop, but where do you see DJing going in the future and, and hip hop going in the future? Well, because so many things are are changing with the way that people are using the letters. It's almost like I'm not really sure. I could really hope that there is this one thing, like, like, let's say there's this one thing that is the basis and the basic principle of DJing that everybody would want to learn. You know what I'm saying? And there's so many different there's DJs who don't touch turntables, don't touch controllers, don't touch nothing, are playing or being called DJs, but they're playing music, but they're not, they're not playing records. Mm. You get what I'm saying? They're, and, and cool, but should it be called DJing? Mm. Or should it be a different performance craft? Because DJing, if we understand it a certain way, if you're not manipulating records with your hands, whether it's a controller, whether it's turntables, whether it's whatever, if that's not what you're doing, I'm like, where's the mix? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Where's the, where's the continuous flow feeling from a bunch of different musics or genres or whatever? Just like, but where's the, that basic skill set that says, oh, that's how you get the DJ. Yeah. That's how you're allowed to use these things because I remember going somewhere and seeing somebody not play any records, but he had DJ in front of his name. And I was like, what did he DJ? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a disc jockey. A DJ is a disc jockey. Where's the disc that you rode? Here's the thing. I, like I'm at the point where like, I don't care what you use DJ wise. It's just, do you use it right? Mm -hmm. Do you know how to use it? You know what I'm saying? So, so, so for me, if you want to use controllers, cool. You want to use turntables, cool. You want to use motorized platters, cool. Do you know how to mix? I don't care what you get. I don't care. You, you want to use an iPad and move the crossfader back and forth. Put it on beat. Mm. Make it sound musical. Make it feel like it has a flow. I don't care what you want to use. You want to use your phone to DJ? I don't care. Can you make it work? Mm. It's interesting though, like hip hop, uh, specifically DJing and, and technology and the way technology has played a role in hip hop. Now, you know, from drum machines, from turntables to drum machines, 
a lot oftentimes you know things that like tur- the turntable is never designed for DJing like the way it w- the way it was used right even the drum machine wasn't designed for the way it was and int- the way it got used it was never intended that way you know it's funny I-, I have to believe it was because we used it for drums until they put samplers in them and they put samplers in them so you could sample yes so I think we used them exactly the way they wanted them to be used. They just didn't know we were going to go that crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? They thought we were just going to sample drums. We're like, nah, we'll, we'll sample what we are what we would rather have, a, what we would sooner have a band play over. We could just sample it and manipulate it ourselves. Oh, you didn't think that was going to happen. And now how you know they didn't think it was going to happen? That's when everybody started chasing the fact that we were using someone's music. So now we got to pay for it. Mm. We had to pay for what they created. Our music comes from struggle. Our music comes from we can't pay for instruments. Our music comes from we can't be in bands because we as a people do not have the money to do it. So all we got are records. And now, oh shit, we found a different way to make the record cool. Oh shit, now we going to expound on that. Oh shit, struggle. We didn't have shit. So what we got? Two records? What we going to do? We going to turn that shit into a band. And then... When you guys make this drum machine, one day you're going to make one that's easy for us to afford somewhat. But we're going to show you how it should really be used. That's just what happened. Comes from struggle. Change the world. Yeah. But every real culture came from struggle. Anyway. (sighs) Oh, we're here for it, Clark. (laughs) Every real struggle comes from, every, every real culture comes from struggle. And poor people create more than rich people. It's just that. Because we have nothing, so we have to create. Not to go, you know, all super racial, but black people damn near create everything. And that's because we create out of a place of trying to get joy for all of the struggle. Mm. So you get jazz. You get rock and roll you get the first music that was ever heard in the world came from black people the second music came from that first music so in essence we're all sampling Mm. because if the first music doesn't happen we don't get the second that came from black people no matter what you say because black people are original people who walk the earth that music was part of their initial expressing themselves. And it felt beautiful to them. And then was like, okay, what are we going to do next? We're going to make it even more beautiful. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. It's going to keep adding on and adding on and adding on. And all these genres that come from it come from the one banging on the drum that they heard at some point. But that drum had a rhythm. Because if the drum doesn't have a rhythm, you don't get to the second one because it doesn't feel good. Yeah, it was a fantastic um thing we we worked with uh, rich medina and dr fredara hadley on um i flip i'm saying her, her name right but it was a fantastic journey about the diaspora and how the music and sampling all mm-hmm. tied in together and you know obviously the context of that and and hip-hop yeah he's gonna say it a lot differently than me because rich medina is a goddamn scholar he's a yeah freaking professor he is he's yeah. gonna say it differently than me so maybe i'll leave that for him to see. yeah shout out rich medina shout though. out rich Professor Rich Medina. Yeah. I call him Professor. Yeah. It, I, again, we're we're really friends. It's sometimes he starts to talk to me and I'm just like, yo, dog, where do you get this stuff from? Yeah. Like, like we could be talking about a sneaker and he will make that shit seem like a thesis. And I'll be like, how did you do that? How did you get me to believe that this is not just a sneaker? He's, he's <laughs> wild. I, I love him for that. Yeah. Speaking of those things uh, that we were just talking on specifically around, you know, music coming from black people, Mm -hmm. what are some things that you see changing in the mainstream that would help? You know, when you look at hip hop and and people think, oh, damn, it started this way. Look where it's at right now. I'm sorry. Hip hop created by black and brown folks. Where did you think it was going to go? They're creative people. The shit's going to go across the street. It's going to go fucking across the world. It's going to come back and it's going to be like, you see what it's like over here? Let's keep moving with this shit. It's just going to keep getting iller and iller and iller. Rap music is the music that lives within the culture of hip hop. And because of that, it's going to keep going. There is no 
you can't like bottle a shit and be like, this is the only way it should be. It's going to be as hip hop was started by young people. And as young people still keep coming up, if they're living within it, their idea might be different than my idea. We have to foster their ideas and say, it's okay. Mm. As long as you learned where the shit came from. That's what our culture, hip hop as a culture, needs to do more often. They need to cultivate its own culture. Because mm. if it does, then the kid who is coming up and wants to make a record, he'll know who Run DMC is. Mm. Do you think that uh, this being the 50th anniversary of hip hop is a great time for, for younger generations to reflect and older, older generations to reflect on that, that history and, and learn from it? I would hope so. But I also know that last year we knew the 50th year was coming. So the celebrations and the teachings and the learnings should have started on day one mm. of, of, of 2023. It should be continuous. There should have been 40 hip hop 50th anniversary con um, concerts already. We knew it was coming. You know what I'm saying? But there are so many people who who benefit off of the culture because of rap that it's not that important to them. What's more important is rap. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because if you ask somebody, like you, if you ask somebody about hip hop, like a lot of people will only talk about rap. That's because it got taken away from the thing, the whole, as the thing that makes the money. And so because it made the money, they sensationalized it and they talked about it the most and they put the, the most into it instead of putting the most in the culture. Now, what the culture didn't do is say, nah, you can't have that. Mm -hmm. If you're not taking this whole thing, you can't have it. Because, again, come from struggle. Oh, you, you, you're you going to help me pay my light bill over here? Yeah, okay, they're going to get it taken away for a little bit. What are you looking forward to the most, though? I'm just looking forward to cool celebrations and hopefully, prayerfully, give backs to the architects. Yeah. I, one day on, on Twitter, I said, if you care or liked or listened to or ever had anything that you gave a fuck about, about hip hop, donate one dollar to Cool Herc. Mm. Motherfuckers go fuck up six dollars on a coffee. <laughs> yep. But we'll play every rap record in the world in their house. I give a dollar. Just a dollar. If everybody, there's billions of people, Cool Hurt should never have to think about money. Because this thing is built off of some ideas he had. And, and and the nuts to throw a party and the nuts to drive around with the stupid ass system in the car. And you know what I'm saying? Like, Bambada should never have to think. Grandmaster Flash, Red Alert, like Hollywood, you know, these people should never even have to think about money. Coat the Rock, never, don't think about, no. Melly Mel, don't you think. Grandmaster Kaz, you better never even have a thought about money. You're the first best rapper ever. You should never, you are the reason why Rakim is great. It's because of you, Grandmaster Kaz. You should never have to think about money. I would love for that to be able to be a thing. Like, I said a dollar. Look, hip hop, that shit is our shit. And if you just took a second and was like, who, 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 who did this for us? Oh, these guys right here create a fund that says they should never, ever have to think about a dollar again. Hip hop is a way of life. That way of life was created out of a struggle. And they were looking for the joy. And they found some joy. Can we thank those guys for finding that joy? I think this is the type of thing that needs to happen. It's a very selfless thing to say that too. And, and it's, and it's a way to, yeah, directly benefit the people that gave us the culture that we all love. Yes. 
you know, it was one time when like Herc wasn't, he wasn't feeling well, like he was a little sick. And I was like, yo, this should not be the case. He shouldn't be thinking about um, insurance. Like, fuck you talking about insurance. I created hip hop. All y'all motherfuckers should be insuring me. Mm. It should be that way. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're hoping to do is really create that thank and that thankfulness and that appreciation for what DJs have done. Mm-hmm. Create that awareness about those people. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, we're also very, really grateful for you, though. I mean, thank you for your not only for your time, but also for all your contributions to hip hop. Well, thank and, you. I'm just trying to add on, and not in a bad way. I want to, I want to I w- I wanna be able to say I want somebody to be able to say contributed in a good way everything that i've done is based off of what i started on turntables Mm. imagine if i don't how do i get to the producer how do i get to working with sneaker brands how do i get to if if i don't play those turntables if i don't give if i don't fall in love with music at like four years old we're not here Mm. you know so i am extremely appreciative I'm extremely responsible to it, and I don't ever want to make it look bad, you know? Because, yes, the culture is one thing, but the music is the reason I got here. So I don't ever want to do anything to it that hurts it, you know? I wanted to ask a question that we ask pretty much everyone we've ever done on this show, Um, and that is, what does the power of music mean to you? The power of music is... Music is the best language ever created. So it's the reason why people can communicate all over the world. Music is, is, is a, con- a, a incredibly connecting fiber. Music is, music is love. I'm a DJ because my grandmother loved a song called Happy Landings. And I learned how to use the stereo and I would turn the record on every time she came in the house, she would be happy. And I was like, this is it. That's the music. I love the music. I love this music. I love the music. And then I understood, I learned what mixing records was. And I just was like, oh, I want to do that. You know, but it's because I would play these songs for my grandmother and she would be happy. She's the most important person I've ever met. And I would make her happy by playing a record. There's got to be something about them records. So I fell in love playing records. And then I fell in love with music. So, and the music was like so much more important than the playing of the records. And I think that's why I'm still here. And your grandmother was very supportive of you, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... Ooh, cause I'm Caribbean and Caribbean households be like, boy, you better find something to do. <laughs> she was just like, okay, as long as you go to school, that's it. Go to school. I was smart, so it was easy to go to school. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's it. Just go to school. Okay, bet. <laughs> so here we is. Um, you know, thank you so much for your time, obviously. Mm-hmm. Thank you for your inspiration. I also want to thank you on behalf of Serato so um, good. as a representative of Serato and also like thank you for all the work you've done with us. You know, you've obviously brought like collaborations together, right. namely the, the Adidas one that's mm-hmm. sitting to your left there. Well, this collaboration happened because of my friendship with OP and not my Serato friendship because I don't get a regular friendship with him unless there's Serato. So cool. I met him through Serato, but like like the second time I spoke to him, it was something else. I usually stay away from brands in a certain way because, you know, usually, usually they're all trying to get something from someone who has some kind of stature or whatever. Like this is one of them brands that I'd I'd be like, yo, tell me everything because of him, you know? So doing the, the collaboration, was to celebrate the fact that 
this brand has this really, really good guy here. Um, I know you're a good guy. We've had good guy times <laughs> yeah. all the time. I know D is a good guy. It's just that. And what's funny is me and D are getting there because we, when I come in here, it's, it's on and popping. Yep. Our conversations all over the place, but it started with him breaking the ice and making me feel like, okay, this is a comfortable safe space where I can go and just be okay. And oh shit, nah, these guys are good. Oh shit, they're really cool people. Ah, oh, damn, man. Like, I'll go hang out there, you know? And because of OP, there is a celebration of what Serato's done for the DJs. And again, like I go back to say, I hope the brand really understands the caliber of person that they have, not the caliber of Serato guy that they have, the caliber of person that they have with OP. He is a special person and he's very important to me. Yeah, man. Pick up OP. <laughs> we gotta get you up in here, man, or something. <laughs> Be roll up OP. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Thank you so much, Clark, for being our guest today, um, celebrating hip hop's 50th anniversary, thanking the DJs. Um, it's been great to have God's favorite DJ. Hey. Thank you. The question. It's 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 good to be here. It's it's good to have been able. It's good to be a subject that you would even want to ask. So I feel honored to. Well, it's been a privilege having you here, and thank you again for your time, and thank you on behalf of Serato for everything you've done for us and the culture. Love is love. Alright man, peace.